everyone, this is Bailey here with the Effort of Grace Worship Team. Just wanted to welcome you all here today, wherever you're at. Hope you're nice and comfortable. And if you're new here today, uh, watching for the first time, please leave a comment or chat message on whatever platform you're on just so that we know that you're here and uh, we get a chance to connect with you. Anyways, uh, let's get started with our service. Good morning. We're so glad that you've joined us here today. We're going to start our worship service off singing in Christ alone. We'd like to invite you to join in with us. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my life, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought. And storm, what heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh. Fullness of God in helpless babe This gift of love and righteousness Scorned by the ones he came to save Till on the cross as Jesus died The wrath of God was satisfied For every sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ I live there in the ground his body lay light of the world by darkness slay then bursting forth in glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory since cursed has lost its grip on me for I am his and he is mine bought with the precious blood of Christ no guilt in life no fear in death this is the power of Christ in me From life's first cry to final breath Jesus commands my destiny No power of hell, no scheme of man Can ever pluck me from his hand Till he returns or calls me home here in the power of christ i'll stand no power of hell no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of christ i'll stand Christ my King 
what a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ my King. What a wonderful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus Sing Death could not hold you so many things that are unknown to us right now. Maybe we have fear and anxiety or we're stressing. Um, our lives aren't normal right now. And that's hard. It's hard. But the best thing that we can do is to place all those things at the foot of the cross and take those to the Lord in prayer. I'd like to ask you to take a few minutes with me here now. Whether um, you're in your living room and you want to pray quietly to yourself or maybe you'd like to pray with your family and to just pray over those things that are trapping you right now, those things that are making you feel uncertain. Lift those up to the Lord. Let's pray together. rest in your promises. Lord, we thank you that even in a time that seems maybe a little even chaotic or maybe we're feeling angry and sad and Lord, that we can 
bring those feelings and those problems and those uncertainties and we can bring them to you in prayer knowing that we can rest in the promises you've given us that you will not leave us or forsake us that we are not living this life alone Lord you're with us every step of the way so Lord as our nation is going through um, a troubled time Lord I just pray for peace I pray for comfort I pray for um, just sound mind and calmed hearts as we rely on you your father to just help us through these times knowing and resting in your plan Lord we pray over our pastors he's about to bring us a message um, on uncertainty Lord, just prepare our hearts for that message, just that um, something that he says today, Lord, can just give us comfort, bring us peace in these uncertain times. So we lift this all up in your most heavenly name. Well, good morning again, Grace Church. So glad that we're all able to be together here digitally with our continuing virtual gathering times. And uh, I, I am just so thankful for how many of you have made this a part of your, your kind of new normal routine while we're in lockdown. And we are praying for our government. We're praying for local, state, federal, all the different people in positions of authority and decision making as we're getting to the point of what it looks like starting to loosen up. And we'll, we'll keep you posted. As a, as a church family, as an organization, how that's going to affect us and what we'll be doing. Uh, but uh, yeah, we'll, we'll keep our eyes on. We're excited about being able to get back together, but we want to make sure that we're wise in how we roll that out. So be praying for us as well as, as leaders here at the church to make sure that we do it in a way that is uh, honoring and respectful to our, uh, to our government, our leaders, and is, is honoring to the Lord. That's what we want to be doing. So, well, with that, I want to let you know that we are continuing here in our uncertainty series. And it's the idea that we can have a certain faith in uncertain times. And uh, we, I couldn't think of something more appropriate for us to, to wrestle through. Again, we want to thank our sister church in Ohio, Grace Fellowship, for helping share some of the ideas and graphics here. And uh, it's a great thing to be a part of the group of churches that we are, that we're able to support and love and encourage one another. And uh, just as they have uh, begun walking through this, we too are going to walk through this idea of how to have that certain faith in uncertain times. And really what we're looking at is kind of a big overview of theology. That's kind of what we're doing with this series. You see, theology is the study of God. It's, it's how we think about God, how we integrate him into our worldviews. And, and the thing is, you need good theology to have good practice. You need to be thinking the right things to then do the right things. And for us to do the right things in the midst of these crazy times, we need to have good theology. Last week, we talked about the idea that the big seminary $7 word we used was sovereignty. But then we said it's really talking about the greatness of God, that God is great, so I don't have to be in control because he is. And then if I understand the greatness of God, it opens up a world of appropriate responses from me and ways for me to interact with my world that is radically different. So what we said was that when the ground is shaky, like it is right now for us, the, the, the ground is shaking, we reach out for something sturdy to grab onto. That's just the natural reaction. When we're, when we're going to fall, we reach out to grab something. And because of that, we said that if God is really great, if God is really great, I can grab onto him and he will see me through this time of uncertainty, this time of shaky ground. So if that's true, if he is great, if I do hold on to him, what should my response be? We said that we should have a unique response, we should have a unique behavioral response that we don't fear the most prolific command in all of Bible, all of the Bible to fear not, but to act missionally. Again, a little bit of a churchy word, but the idea that I act as though I am on mission, that I've been given something to do, and I have the opportunity now to pursue it. And we said, how do we do it? How do we uh, not fear, but act missionally? We framed it out with the idea of looking to God, that if he's there, well, I, I need to look to him. 
And not just any God or a sort of God, but the God of the Bible, the Bible, or the God that the Bible describes that is reflected through the person and work of Jesus, that I can look at who Jesus was, how he did, how he acted, that that would be the picture that I should look to. And we do that in this big sense by looking back to what we know God has done what he's shown us in the past, the fact that he is a promise maker who's also a promise keeper. We look forward to the promises that have yet to be fulfilled, knowing because he's kept the promises he's made in the past, we can trust him with the future. So we look back and take comfort for what he's done. We look forward with expectation and hope for what's promised down the road, but then we also look up. We look up in worship. The the Bible talks about it as finding our rest, our peace, our shalom, that Jewish idea of completeness and well-being. We do all of that to rest in God, that I can, whatever's going on around me, I can be sure and safe in the hands of a loving God who is great, who is able to hold all things together. We, we looked at that as kind of our closing verse, that he holds all things together in the person of Jesus. Well, if that's all true, and if, if you haven't seen that, I invite you to go back to last week's video, take a look at that, maybe get caught up. But from here, if that's true, if God is really great, well then, it leads us to the next point of our, of our theological framework. But before we hop into that, I want to give you this thought. And if you, if you take notes, this would be a, a good one to jot down for yourself. And that is that disruption is a unique opportunity. Disruption or interruption is a unique opportunity. And we don't have time to go through all of these. I started tracing them out and it just, the, the list kept going on and on and on. But if you're familiar all with the Bible, if you've been part of the church, names like Noah and Abraham and Moses and Caleb and Joshua and Gideon and Nehemiah, these are all people who are recorded in scripture where their life got interrupted, where there was a disruption for how they were doing things, where they were going. They might have been at peace. They might have been uh, secure and, and, and feeling good about what was happening. But then God intervened or life intervened and things got all shook up and they had a point of decision. They had an opportunity. When the interruption, when the disruption came in, all of these guys had the opportunity to respond. And how they responded developed them into particular consequences. Things happened where uh, humanity as a species was, was rescued, was saved. Was, in others, it was God's covenant family was started. In others, millions of people were set free from slavery. In others, dis decisive military battles were won. There's so much stuff that happened when people who were interrupted responded to the opportunity in a correct way. The one thing I want us to look at right now is, is a little bit of how the, the Apostle John, one of Jesus's first initial uh, disciples, uh, wrote about Jesus and, and kind of what it meant when he came. So if you've got your Bibles, turn to John chapter 1. We're just going to look at a few verses here quick. And what we see here in John chapter 1 and in verse 1 are these words. In the beginning was the Word. And so you understand that's John is in this section using the Word to refer to Jesus, that he is the clearest expression of who God is. So in the beginning was the Word, or Jesus. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So we got this picture here. This is God. We're talking about Jesus, but it's clear that this Jesus is God himself. Well, then we keep going into to verse uh, 4 or 5 where he says, In him, in Jesus, was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And then we skip down to verse 14. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory is the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. That's just a, a beautiful, wonderful picture of this incredible God taking on flesh, taking on humanity to bring light and life and grace and truth to the world. Beautiful picture, right? But understand, God interrupted, disrupted the world. So the question is, how did the world respond? And this is the 
the, the principal example, the kind of the paradigm for how God looks at these interruptions, at these disruptions. <coughs> and if we step back to verse 10 of chapter 1, we see one primary way of responding. See, so Jesus came, he was God, fully God, bringing light and life and, and grace and truth. Verse 10, though, it says, he was in the world, Jesus was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. Goes on and says, he came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. And primarily, the, the, the context here that John is writing to is, is really the Jewish people, and that they had their mindset that when Jesus came, they were looking for Jesus to come, but they had crafted in their, their own way of thinking about it, that he had to, to check off certain boxes, that he would act this way, that if God came, if the Messiah came, he would be this. And Jesus interrupted their plans and their thinking and came and did as something very different. And the response was that, well, they didn't really know him. They didn't perceive of him correctly, but then also they didn't receive him. They didn't comprehend the magnitude. They didn't accept the import of who he was, what it meant that Jesus had come the way that he did. And so they rejected. So the interruption came, the, the disruption came, and their response was to turn away, was to reject. But then look what happens if we get to verse 12. Here in verse 12 it says, but to all who did receive him, to for those who believed in his name, who, who pulled in and said, yes, I believe in who you are. I believe in what you've done. I believe in who you what you say you're going to accomplish. Those people who were able to wrap in around that, that he then gave the right to become children of God. That when we look at the interruptions and the disruptions that God allows to, into our lives as opportunities to become, to do what he wants us to do, to be who he wants us to be, that when we step into those and embrace those, when we see them the way Jesus does, then we, we actually have the opportunity to become God's family. And that is when, with our response to Jesus, we, we can literally become part of God's family. But then moving forward, as more interruptions and more disruptions come, I can act like the family that I'm a part of. You know, one of the phrases I uh, say to my son sometime, sometimes is, you know what? In this family, we don't whatever. Or in this family, we, and I set out the expect expectations, that to be the family that we are, here's how we respond. Whatever the interruption, whatever the disruption to what we were thinking, and let me tell you, with kids, they can get razor-focused on a particular thing, a particular way of going about stuff. And if we're honest, we as grown-ups can do the same thing, but when that interruption comes in, how will I respond? Will I receive what God is, is telling me? Will I believe in his greatness and then act the way he's outlined, hey, this is what it means to be part of the family? Well, how will we choose to deal with the disruption of the COVID-19 lockdown? Well, because, again, this is all building off where we went last week, because God is great, I want to suggest that we can trust in his goodness. Because God is great, I don't have to be in control. But because God is good, I don't have to look for my worth, for my satisfaction anywhere else. That I can trust God to be in control, to bring good out of even the most chaotic situation of my life. And I would suggest it this way, again, a place to maybe jot a note down here, is that God's goodness is transformative. God's goodness is transformative. Now, I wanna share another story from the Bible. And in this story, I'm going to go through six chapters in hopefully about a minute. So we're going to go real fast. But it's a story, if you've been connected to church or read your Bible or uh, just, just heard some stuff, uh, you, you might have run across. It's the story of Joseph. You see, Joseph was one of 12 brothers, son of a, of a guy named Jacob. And he was the favorite kid. And it, it became very clear that, that, that Jacob, father, uh, absolutely adored this, this son, and he favored him. He even gave him this special, beautiful, ornate, flamboyant coat, and it kind of set him apart as being the favorite. 
Well, then Joseph started getting some dreams, and in these dreams, which came from God, he was in authority over the rest of his family, both his brothers and his parents, and he went ahead and told them, hey, you guys are all going to bow down to me. Well, as probably any other sibling that we could imagine, they, the brothers didn't take this real well. And one day, while they were out in a the field, they, they kind of grabbed him and threw him into a, a dry pit and were planning on killing him. But at the last moment, they changed the plan and they sold him into slavery. And after being sold into slavery, he ended up in Egypt serving a guy named Potiphar, who was an influential man of, of wealth. And while he was there, he pursued God and says that, that God was with him in what he was doing, even though he was in this terrible, difficult situation. And while he was there, he began to have success, and he became very powerful in Potiphar's house. But then one day, Potiphar's wife, she caught, uh, she caught a vision of, of Joseph and thought he was a strapping young lad, made a pass at him. Well, Joseph uh, spurned the advance and ran out, and in turn, Potiphar's wife accused him of attempted rape, and he was thrown into jail. <coughs> then, while in jail, it says again that God was with him even there, and he, he moved up in the ranks of prisoners and began sailing or serving the jailer there. And while he was there, there were other people who were uh, incarcerated. He had some fellow inmates who they had dreams and couldn't understand them. But Joseph was able to tell them the interpretation, and it turned out to be correct. And the one that was freed uh, as a result, uh, years later, as he was serving the most powerful king, the most powerful empire in Egypt, the, the, the leader Pharaoh, Pharaoh had a dream that he couldn't understand, and this guy said, oh, when I was in prison, this guy interpreted for me. So they brought Joseph in. Joseph was able to interpret the dream correctly and said, you're going to have seven years of plenty, and then you're going to have seven years of extreme famine. And as a result, as this became true, Joseph rose up to be second in command to the most powerful man of the earth at that time, to second in command to Pharaoh. Well, as the story goes, we're going to start zooming in now. The seven years of plenty hit, and Joseph managed that for Pharaoh. They got huge stockpiles, but then the famine came after the years of plenty. And the famine was so severe, it reached back to Joseph's world uh, or land of birth, where he, where he entered the world. And his family came to Egypt looking for help. And while he was there, it, Joseph revealed himself to his brothers, and they were terrified because they knew what they had done to him. And yet, here's what he says. Look here, and this is in, in Genesis 45. Starting in verse 5, it says, Now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. And then look here. This is what he said to his brothers. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. See, Joseph had seen, had experienced, had communed with God in such a way that he recognized that even in this horrible thing that the brothers did, they were free will agents acting in this way, although they intended bad for it, that God was able to be the one who was the orchestrator of it all for something good here for the, for the salvation. And look how he says, again, we're going to jump to chapter 50 just real quickly. And this is a, a little bit later after Jacob dies, and now the brothers are scared. Well, maybe, he, maybe Joseph was just being nice to us because our dad was alive and said, please, please forgive us. Here's his response. He says, you meant evil against me. It's not that he's unaware of what they did, and not that they didn't do it, that they weren't responsible, but God meant it for good to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Don't miss this. God's goodness is transformative. It takes what free will people, people who being made in the image of God have the freedom to exercise their, their, their choice in however, however they want to. And that, that man, because of our sin, we will often push into evil and selfishness and greed. That we will do that. That even that, God is intending all along to bring about remarkable and amazing good. And he can because he is great. He is in control. Because God is great, we can trust him to be good. And God's goodness is transformative. So what do we do with that? Well, I want to suggest that we do one thing in three ways right now to wrap our brains around it for where we're at. And this isn't going to be exhaustive, and there's lots of places we could go. But just to get our brains rolling 
in this direction, I want to suggest that we need to find the good. And by that I mean if we know that God is in the, the business of taking what is evil, transforming it into good, or taking what people intend for evil, all the while making it fit in this mysterious and yet powerful way into a sovereign plan to accomplish the best good ever, I need to find it, meaning I need to look for it. And I would suggest we think about it this way. What is the unique good that God is doing in your life through this season? And maybe even a better way is, what is the unique good that God is trying to do in your life through this season? We can look back and see some things he's already done, but I think it's going to be important for us to look for that good that we might miss if we don't have our eyes trained on it. But I would suggest the very first way is, is a very personal one, and that is that we need to find the good in the growth that God wants to happen in my life. You see, God doesn't want us to just stay the way we are. Not because he doesn't love us. Not because we have to reach some level of good enough to be acceptable. We are loved and cherished because we're his kids. There's nothing we can do to earn it. But just like with our own kids, I want my kids to grow and to develop. I talk to my, my kids about here's what it, what it means to, to be a man. And it's not what the world's going to tell you. It's not going to be what you hear in a lot of different places. But here are the qualities, sons, that I want you to step up into. Be honorable, be truthful, these kind of things. And God has set some standards for us. And one place to look, it's kind of all-inclusive. It's a verse that's, that I use to kind of filter a lot in my own life. is Colossians 3.17. And what we read here is, And whatever you do, in word or deed, all things, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Catch that? Each and everything we do should be done in such a way that it's as if I'm speaking for Jesus. That what I say and what I do is exactly what Jesus would say and Jesus would do. I don't know about you, but I know I'm not there. I know that that is a, a standard that I am woefully inept at really holding onto and really pursuing and really achieving. But I know that's the goal, that's the standard. In other places, the Bible tells us that we should be imitators of Jesus, that our lives should reflect to the world around us, this is what Jesus looks like. But if I'm not there, and I'm supposed to be there, the inference there, I, th I think a logical conclusion is that God is interested in us moving from the point of not towards the point of be. God is interested in our growth, and right now, that is not only spiritual, because we are a body-soul unity. God cares about the physicality of us. At the end of all things, we will not be disembodied spirits floating around in the clouds somewhere. The Bible describes our future joy as body and soul coming back in perfect harmony with nothing breaking, with everything working, and it's glorious, but it's body and soul. We, the physicality to who we are is part of God's design and intended order. So what do I do even with my physical body right now? What growth is God looking for in my life? We've joked a little bit about the uh, freshman 15 that many of us experienced when we went to college, right? Well, now we're joking about the COVID-19. And uh, many of us might have bumped even past the 19 during our uh, several weeks of lockdown. But maybe that's something we need to do. Maybe we need to be taking a better look at, at how we're eating and how we're exercising and caring for the body that God gave us. But maybe it is more spiritual. Maybe this is the time as, <clears throat> as the pause button has been put on our lives, as this disruption has come in, that we have the opportunity to look for growth to say, you know what, I've never really been good at reading my Bible. I'm going to spend time right now on a regular basis reading God's Word, finding out what God has to say, what he's recorded for us. Maybe it's time to, to devote more time to prayer. Maybe it's those things that God has wanted me to learn and develop to be more useful for him. You know, maybe you play a musical instrument and you thought, man, this would be great if I could help bless my church family and lead the church family music, but I'm not quite good enough. Right? I, I need to freshen up and, and re remember how to do this right. Well, right now, maybe you have the time. There's a whole myriad of things that God wants to grow you in right now. And the question is, what is that unique good that God wants for you in this season right now when it comes to your growth? But it's not just all about you. I'd suggest the second major area is this issue of relationships, and in, in particular, close and important relationships. The busyness of everything going on in normal life, so many of our important relationships have been pushed to the side. 
And that's not good. You know, so many times we've uh, had to shortchange our family or, or good friends time because we're just running all over the place. But maybe right now because sports practices are canceled and music lessons are canceled and all these extracurricular things for our kids are canceled and the clubs and the gym and the this, that, and the other that typically consume so much of my time, even work and travel around. Maybe right now, part of the disruption that God has allowed into our lives is to refocus us on those important relationships. And the Bible is riddled with calls for community and the value that God places on community. Look here what it says in Proverbs. It says, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. And right now, church, we're, we're in adversity. And we're a church family. We are brothers and sisters. Who do we need to focus on? Who do we need to reach out to? Who do we need to work on building the relationship of in the midst of this adversity? Because, then you skip to chapter 27 in, in Proverbs, faithful are the wounds of a friend. This is the idea that we have to challenge and exhort and push one another on because profuse are the kisses of an enemy. The idea that you're going to get all kinds of great lip service from people who don't really care about you. But we have the opportunity amongst our, our close friends, amongst our family, amongst our church family, that in the midst of this adversity, we can love well. We can build and develop on that. That God, when he created everything and said everything was good at the very beginning of all things, the one thing he said was not good was for man to be alone. It was that first description that we are designed for community. So right now, how can we find the good in building and repairing those important relationships? Maybe right now there's a broken relationship in your life. Maybe between a longtime friend or something soured, or maybe it's with a family member. Maybe right now is that time to say, in light of all the craziness, I've gotten perspective, and this disruption means that I need to take advantage of the unique opportunity to make things right. So we can find the good in our growth and our relationships, but also I would suggest this in serving others. So much we could say here, but I want to tap into one idea, and that is the, the nature of what it means to serve. Because we need to find the good that we can be doing for others, even in the midst of a lockdown. There's a story in the Bible that many people are familiar with. It's called the story of the Good Samaritan. And real quickly, a guy came to Jesus and said, what do I need to do for eternal life? Jesus said, well, what do you read in the Bible? And he said, love God with everything you've got and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, great, go and do this. And he said, well then, Lord, who is my neighbor? He really wanted to, to figure this out. Okay, if, if those are things, what does it mean? I, I only want to love the person I need to love. And Jesus told a story about a man who was walking down the street, a Jewish man. And as he was on this road out in the kind of the country, he was beset by robbers. He was beaten, thrown into a ditch. He was, all his possessions were taken and he was left for dead. Of course, of time, a, a Pharisee walked by, kind of just stepped right over him, passed by, wouldn't touch him. Then another guy, a Levite, somebody who worked in the temple, uh, did the same thing. Wouldn't even stop or touch or take care of him. There's all kinds of reasons for why that might have been. But here are these really, uh, the world would have said righteous people who ignored this man in the ditch. And then came along the Samaritan. You have to understand that the Samaritan people and the Jewish people didn't get along. They didn't like one another. In particular, the Jews really snubbed their nose at the Samaritans. They didn't associate with each other. But as the Samaritan came up and saw the man in the ditch, he cared for him. He, he, he bandaged his wounds and, and, and took, took care of him, put him, and I'm putting on his donkey and taking him to a nearby inn where he paid money for the man to recover there. And he said, I have to keep going. He's talked to the innkeeper. I have to keep going, but uh, I will come back. And if there's anything else owed, I will pay it. That he sacrificed deeply for this man that he never even met. In fact, a man that if they had probably met on the road, the man would have even walked off the road to avoid him. And so here's what Jesus said. After he, after he told that story, he said, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? The man said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said, don't miss this, because this isn't just a neat little story. This isn't just an intellectual exercise. Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. We are to serve everyone. We are to serve those who are in need. We are to serve in such a way that it takes sacrifice. And that's one of the things we've looked at before church. 
that it take to really serve, if you're going to really serve, it's not something that happens out of the excess. It doesn't happen out of the abundance, the overflow. Like, well, I uh, finally got everything I need. Well, here's a little bit left over. I can throw that at someone. No, it takes sacrifice, it takes intentionality, it takes pushing beyond the boundaries that even our culture might say, well, no, you don't really want to associate with them. For whatever reason, we need to look for ways to find the good for others. We need to be serving others. And maybe right now, that's as simple as when you run out to get groceries, you call one or two of your neighbors and say, hey, I'm taking a quick trip to the grocery store, can I pick you anything up? Maybe it's just checking in on a regular basis. Maybe it's writing a note to someone who's, who's down and saying, I'm here if you need anything. Can I, can I be an encouragement to you? We have to look for it. We have to look for these opportunities of unique good that God is trying to do in our lives, in the lives of our relationships, our communities, and in, in the serving of others to find good for them. Because I want to suggest this. As we've said this before, that God, because God is great, we can trust in his goodness. Because God is great, he is in control, we can trust in his goodness. All my satisfaction, all my value, all my worth, all the uh, coming together of the things that seem out of control, I can trust him with that, that he will bring good out of evil. Because that's the kind of God he is. I'd further suggest that by finding the good, if we really do that... If that's our intention as a church family, as individuals, as families, if we find the good, that will allow us to have a faith that is bigger on the other side of this uncertainty. If we find the good in my growth, in my relationships with others, and in serving others, that will develop a faith within me that is stronger and more vibrant, more robust than ever before on the other side of this. <coughs> There's so many ways we could do this. And I can't tell you exactly what yours is. But I would suggest that this week, we push into this idea of looking to God by looking for the good that he's trying to accomplish. This is how we will be able to have a certain faith in uncertain times. One other verse that can be pulled out of context sometimes, but I really think uh, it captures here the idea of what happened with Joseph and what God is calling us to now. In the book of Romans, we read these words, chapter 8. And we know that though, for those who love God, for those who are part of God's family, they've, they've stepped into this relationship with God, that all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. And it's a beautiful statement that all of the evil that the, the world could intend, that sin brings about in the world, God can sovereignly use it to accomplish his good. And that's what we can do now. We can look to God by finding the good in what's happening right now and what God wants us to do. Church, thanks for joining in with us. Uh, again, I want to remind you that if uh, you want to connect with us during this time, sending us an email is probably the best way. Uh, GraceChurchEfforta at gmail.com. Uh, you can find that on our Facebook page, our website. There's lots of ways there to, to connect in. Uh, to get that email and get it sent to us. But let us know what's going on. I'd love for you to share stories of how you have found the good already in the midst of this disruption. I'd love for you to send us stories of how you're going to find good or how you're going to pursue finding that good. And of course, if you have come to the point where even now you've recognized your need for a savior and that you're either ready to commit your life or you've already committed your life to say, all right, Jesus, you get to be in control and I'll follow you with gratitude. Please reach out to us so that we can touch base and help you maybe take some of those next steps. And as you're able, as our needs continue as a church, as our needs really in our community grow and grow, your ability to, to continue giving through our online portal or through sending in checks will be, be beneficial for us to be able to continue blessing people to serving our community in a remarkable way. So we encourage you to do that as you're able and led by the Lord. Church, thanks for joining in. We'll see you real soon.